Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here for today's alum Zoom. My name is Melissa Bostrom, and I'm the Assistant Dean for Graduate Student Professional Development in the Graduate School. And I want to thank our partners, the Office of Postdoctoral Services and the Duke Career Center for collaborating with us on this series. And you see Molly Starbeck, the Director of the Postdoc Office, waving this morning. Thank you, Molly, for being here. So I am delighted to introduce our guest this morning, Mike Janesta, who is Senior Analytic Software Tester at the SAS Institute. He is demonstrating there the Zoom Wave. And he began his, current, uh, his career at SAS as a junior software tester and was promoted to his current position in 2018. He has been testing analytic solutions at SAS since 2010. Uh, mostly covering modern visualization tools for established data science methods. He completed both his master's and PhD in mathematics at Duke. So please join me in a round of virtual applause for our guest today. We will begin the conversation today with the five career questions that we ask every alum. And then we'll move on to address questions that pop up in the chat or that came in through registration. Um, Please feel free to raise your hand if you want to unmute and ask a question or just post questions in the chat as we go for our audience members. So to get us started today, um, Mike, could you tell us about your background? Um, so as Melissa mentioned, I got my um, master's and PhD in mathematics from Duke. I also have a BA in mathematics from the University of Notre Dame. And I was always interested in math. I was very good at it. Um, and when I was at the end of my PhD, I realized um, I, I didn't really want to be in academia long term because as much as I liked math, I didn't particularly like writing grants. Um, so I uh, decided to look for work here in the Triangle and I got this software testing job, even though I don't have a statistical background uh, statistics as a field and mathematics as a pure field are quite different as I, as I learned here at SAS. Um, but even with a, a purely theoretical background in mathematics, I was still able to offer the company something useful in terms of um, skilled analysis of their various products. I started working on a forecasting intelligence product for large retailers. And then I moved on to this visualization product I work on now, which is more open-ended uh, and targeted at anybody trying to grapple with their own large body of data within their company. So that my, my strict background is theoretical, uh, but now that I've been at the company for quite a bit, um, over 10 years, I've sort of merged into a fake statistical background by osmosis. Um, that is a great, wonderful answer. Thank you. So you mentioned, you know, at SAS, they're really known for statistics and analytics. So how did you get your job at SAS um, with the mathematics background? So how is um, maybe not as, as helpful Basically, my wife's personal network is very good and they, several of her friends work here at SAS and they were able to get me an interview for an analyst position. Intentional, I didn't go to uh, any job fairs or anything looking to get into software testing specifically. Um, so in that sense, I got my job a little arbitrarily, um, but the the skills required for the job were either um, background in testing software specifically or an advanced degree in a technical field like mathematics so that I could bring the domain expertise and then learn about testing product level software at a company uh, on the fly as opposed to the opposite. Many of my fellow testers have experienced testing software as their particular expertise, and they learn about the statistical and analytical features while they're here. And so I sort of did the opposite. They don't, they don't get a lot of applicants in the testing field who have advanced technical degrees. They get that more uh, in the research side of the company, 
people who specifically want to do cutting edge computer science. Um, that's typically where the advanced technical degrees apply, it says. Thank you. That's very helpful and very interesting that it was your personal network that, that actually helped you break in. Uh, it's great to use every resource that you have when you're in your job hunt. So can you talk a little bit about what is a typical day like at SAS and both pre-COVID and then in the current moment? Pre-COVID, there were a lot of social functions. SAS prides itself on work-life balance. They have soccer fields, they have a gym, they have a swimming pool, they have cafeterias in multiple buildings. And my typical day involved taking advantage of at least one of those things. Um, obviously now that's all been closed. They've, they've reopened a few things, um, but none of the things that I take advantage of. So even though I'm here in my office, um, I'm very lonely. There's nobody else in the hallway at the moment. Um, yeah, so the typical day has changed in that sense, but doing my actual day-to-day -day work hasn't changed much. And I, I'm very fortunate that remote work for software testing is pretty much the same whether I'm doing it at my desktop or doing it remotely by a, a VPN connection. So I typically spend about an hour just gauging what are the issues that have popped up since I last uh, fired up the software. And I'll look at overnight bug reports from international teams, um, Beijing and, and offices in India. They find a lot of bugs overnight from my perspective anyway. And so I make sure that I don't retread their ground and I answer questions that they have sometimes because they're all functional testers and, and not domain experts as I am. Uh, so that's the beginning of my day. And then for the rest of the day, I design tests on the fly or design feature tests for things that are coming down the pike. And I uh, am actually involved in the design a lot as a domain expert. The developers who are Java experts or, um, or CSS experts, if they're designing a feature to show an analytical capability of SAS, but they don't actually know what that an analytic capability does, they will sometimes consult me and say, you know, is this the right way to show someone how a model is performing? Because otherwise I'm just throwing a graph on the screen and not really know what it ought to look like. So I do, I do spend some time um, a little bit in the design phase with them. Very interesting, thank you. So now that we've heard a little bit about what your responsibilities are, what suggestions do you have for the graduate students and postdocs who are on the call today for how they can prepare to enter this kind of field? So when you say this kind of field, I will answer with two different kinds of fields of mine. Um, product level software as a field, either testing it or developing it. And this emerging field that has lots of different names, but which at SAS they call data science. It's a big catch-all term. You might have heard big data or, or whatever, lots of different names being thrown around. For product level software environment, I, I didn't have any formal training in this. And if you wanted to get into that as a field, there is no substitute for um, getting your feet wet on real coding. Um, I, as, a, as a graduate student, did some very limited coding, uh, mostly in Python, but a little bit of C++, a little bit of MATLAB, any, anything uh, that would serve my purposes. I would do a small project, very contained, and that's not what product level software is like at all. Research software can be whatever gives you the answer you need. It can be inefficient. You don't have to comment it. You don't have to give it to anyone else for review unless you work in a group. Uh, I, I was uh, researching on my own with my advisor. And that's that doesn't prepare you for what a product level software environment is like. And so if you wanted to get prepared for something like that, there's no substitute for working with real world data working with real world open source libraries. And I don't have a lot of good suggestions about where you can get training for that because in my experience, the training, 
that I have received um, both in just looking online for free stuff, but also some of the courses I've been enrolled in um, at SAS, they typically will make a contained virtual environment with scripts that you follow, but the scripts also have the answers in them. And it, I have found that they're not really helping me learn how to make code that works. Um, but on the other side, if you're, if you're not as interested in the product software part of what my job is like, if you're interested in data science and how do you prepare for that field, I would recommend getting involved in any inter-collaboration kind of project. I did a few projects like this back at Duke where in the math department, we were offering some analytical skills uh, to people working in the biology department or the computer science department, working on analyzing different kinds of biological networks in either DNA sequencing or gene expression. And so we, we developed a sort of software to work together. And so that was the only situation in which I had to deal with somebody else's expectations, somebody else's um, needs on how a software project would develop. And if I had spent more time on that, I think I would have been more prepared to deal with some of the challenges of working in a product environment and also working in what are my, what are my customers needs here at SAS. Some of the best experiences I have are trying to find a publicly available data set either from say a season of football um, statistics or medical data coming out in the last year on um, COVID testing and, and things like this. If you just take publicly available data and try to attack it, you start to realize what are some of the issues that customers are gonna have when they're looking at their internal sales numbers and their customer feedback. How do they process it? How do they deal with hundreds of columns and hundreds of thousands to millions of rows how do they make sense of it? How do they distill it for their executives? Um, a research project like that is one of the best ways that you can prepare yourself. And as an abstract mathematician, I avoided most of those kinds of projects. Um, I have a lot of colleagues who went to NC State in their advanced analytics program, and they give you a summer's worth of really intense mathematics and computer science training. And the whole rest of it is a large hands-on data project with data submitted by partner organizations. It's their real internal or, um, data and it has, it's long, it's wide, it's as real world as it gets. So those are the kind of projects that if you have an opportunity at Duke to explore, they would really help you um, encounter some of these vague challenges that data science is trying to make more formal. That's very helpful. Thank you. And I think you answered one of the questions that came in through the registration uh, along the way there, too. So I'm going to move on now to the fifth question. And I'm saying that to our audience to prepare to submit your own questions, either share them in the chat or unmute yourself. So what's the employment, employment outlook like for um, the two fields that you mentioned, if you feel like you can, can talk about that a bit? I can. Um, from my perspective, the outlook is good because both from the perspective of competitors coming to the triangle, and I shouldn't say direct competitors, but other tech companies are coming to the triangle um, and they'll be hiring. I don't know if they'll be hiring in the same kind of big data science field, um, but certainly in, in computer science and product level software, I imagine there'll be lots of openings there. And then from the perspective of people at SAS who aren't leveraging the generous benefits package and would rather try to leverage more a direct salary um, compensation, a lot of younger people have moved on and they've found work right here in the triangle. And so from my perspective, people are coming into SAS from other places, they're leaving SAS for other places right here in the triangle. And it, it seems to me that the prospect is good. I haven't, we don't have a lot of layoffs here ever, but even in the last year, um, they've only, they've, they've been able to carry 
the bulk of the company. Um, and it's, it's really only in building services that SaaS employment has been hurt. The actual research and development is as healthy as ever. So from my outlook, it, it's good. But since this is the only job I've ever had, um, you can't quote me on, on how um, easy the process is. And as I told you, I, I kind of got my job um, without having to spend a lot of time putting my resume out there and, and calling people. So again, the job search aspect of it, I'm not as sure, but lots of people that I know in this field are, are changing employers and finding employment. That is good news. Thank you. So I want to turn things over now to our audience to get your questions. Um, hello. Hey, Mike. I'm, I'm Qing Long Xu, and I'm a second year, soon to be third year, math PhD at Duke. And uh, I, thank you for your sharing. and. Uh, Right now, I was like, uh, because I, I know what you're saying, like involving in a research project with, related to data science is very important to prepare us for the skills at the job interview. But uh, like in data science, uh, we have, I don't know, it seems like there are many different kinds of data. And for each data, they have a particular feature by themselves. Like right now, I'm working on biological data and uh, I'm not sure, I mean, like it will be transferable to other different kind of data. So is there any recommendation, like, like what is more common or what, what things what we can do to prepare more? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Xinglong, that's actually a great question. SAS's offerings are really, they have a wide variety specifically for that reason. Um, you're right. The, the kind of project you're working on is probably similar to what I was working on, very focused on um, lab collected data and analyzing it for specific behaviors or trends, or maybe you had a model and you want to try and prove the accuracy and efficacy of the model. That kind of data analysis is not going to help you if you're trying to get into text analysis, right? A lot of uh, our customers at SAS, what they have is a, just reams and reams of free form customer feedback, reviews of their products, um, people sending in bug reports or questions, and they have to collect that and analyze that in a completely different way than a predictive modeler would be trying to analyze data. Or if you are taking crime statistics or health statistics and trying to prepare some kind of report to government officials that you work for, or if you're trying to make a recommendation or advocate for legislation or some, some other kind of project, you're gonna analyze that data for specific trade-offs perhaps in different things happening. You have to join it with other related fields of data. And the only thing I can recommend from experience here at SAS trying to test scenarios like that is you really have to engage with it. There's no, there's no way to approach them all. As you say, they are the way that you collect the data and organize it is largely determined by what kind of field you're working in. And so getting experience with a, a real data project is the best way to find out what kinds of things you'll have to become good at. Uh, which is why data science is still a very vaguely defined field. And if you want to be a data scientist without any other qualifiers, um, you, you really need to try and branch out. Um, one of the open source places that's trying to expose people to that, to different challenges is this Kaggle website, K-A-G-G-L-E, where they put on little contests, they give a little sample of data from someone who is going to sponsor a contest and you try to really hard to model it on your own or in a group and send back some kind of predictive model or analysis 
and they get judged by whoever submitted the data and they give out small prizes to whoever did the best job. And the most famous of these that I'm aware of is that Netflix submitted customer reviews of suggested titles and people tried to model um, better predictions of titles or people based on their viewing history and their ratings of previous recommendations. And that, that contest, from what I understand, generated at least some um, hiring opportunities or at least perhaps buying of somebody's model from whoever, whoever won it. I don't know who won it. But that's an area where people didn't you know, spend a lot of time working on the field before interacting with Netflix. They just found this opportunity through a, a competition website. Um, it's, a, it's sort of a wild west out there. And if you are employed in a particular data science field, uh, they'll give you a, a more narrow path to walk. But if you're just kind of trying to get started, um, it's tough because it's, it's so open-ended. There's many different types of data analysis tools and SAS has offerings galore. Thank you. Yeah. That was a great question to kick us off. Hello, Mike. Hello, my, my name is Josen Tom and I'm a final year PhD student at uh, Duke. So a related question, not a related question. So, I mean, I'm an international student. So does SAS hire international students and what, I mean, I mean, just in general, uh, I mean, um, uh, I mean, and in the field of data science in the triangle, are the opportunities uh, good for international students? Absolutely. Uh, we have a very strong international presence here in the main office in Cary, but also around the world. Um, I would say if you go strictly by numbers, more than half of my immediate coworkers don't even live in the country. Right? They're in India or they're in China. And so the hiring opportunities uh, for international students who wish to stay in the United States are as, are as open as they are for um, abroad. But even here in the country, uh, there's a lot of satellite offices. And one of the things that SAS and many tech companies learned this year is who cares if you're working on site in the office? They can save a ton of money on remote work. And we've been getting surveys here. You know, would you like to work at home permanently? Would you like to do flex time? Um, so I, they haven't answered all those questions formally yet. Um, they do, every couple of years, they do a big office shuffle to collect groups to be closer together in the buildings. And I think the next one will likely involve something like formally um, offering people uh, work from home positions. And so I imagine that if you wanted to stay and work, that that would be one option, but you could also um, return home and, and work from there. It's, it, it seems to be one of the few good things about this horrendous last year is there's going to be a big, in the tech world, in any remote work type of field, there's going to be a big opportunity to make work more flexible now that we were forced to do it. Thank you. Yeah. Terrific. Do we have another question from the audience? Yeah. Hi, Mike. Thanks for being here. Um, you mentioned briefly that you took a couple of courses um, in preparing for your sort of software focused job. I, I wonder if, if any of those you, you would recommend or, or other uh, or or not, <laughs> you know, or th th resources that you would recommend besides the Kaggle competitions you mentioned. Uh, so, yeah, let me let me specify what I meant there. So um, internally, SAS sometimes enrolls us in uh, third-party software training courses, uh, but this is a, is a new initiative to try and unify the skill set across the company. Um, my own personal reaction to that is that it's not good because it is, it's recorded, there's no opportunity to interact and get questions answered, 
and the way that it the way that it's done is you like I said you get a virtual environment and they have uh, a script that you're supposed to fill in with code but the way that you check that you're right is you go to another folder where they have the code filled out and so it's not you don't really learn it by the pain of my code doesn't work my code doesn't work my code doesn't work that's the way you really learn to code is that your code doesn't work until you make it work um, now at duke i did take some computer science courses because i realized i was going to need to do at least some coding and i didn't know any python at the time so i enrolled in a computer science course that was um, I don't remember the exact title of the course, but it was focused around topics in gene sequencing and pattern matching using Perl and Python as the languages. That was, for me, a, a hugely beneficial course because I did have to prepare all the code on my own. Uh, and I learned a lot of lessons there that I would not have learned um, just trying to, you know, Stack Overflow is great. It has every question that you can ask, but also it has, it's, you can get sloppy that way. Oh, I'll just copy something off of Stack Overflow and plug it in my code and not really learn best practices and whatnot. Um, so I, I would not recommend taking recorded content unless you were just trying to figure out syntax. Um, that's the only thing that I did learn was how to do uh, the, the remote uh, repository kind of things, like with Git. I didn't know anything about that, and I took a video course, and so I learned the Git syntax for pulling down copies of projects, um, merging code, things like this. There's a dozen commands you need to know, and the video showed me all of them, and so that was that. Um, but I didn't really learn anything um, difficult the way that you would trying to figure out how do I design an algorithm to do XYZ? How do I debug it? Things like that. The, the Git commands is very simple to learn in a course the way that syntax is not. You, you have to just grapple with it trying to make something. I, and so if you wanted to, if you really felt like you needed to learn coding, one of the things that I did that was a project that I was motivated to do that motivated me to find out the best ways to do this is to program a simple game. I thought it would be fun to make a simple text version of games that I owned. Um, and trying to program a simple game is not a simple task. And I never actually completed those projects all the way, but I learned way more about programming than I did from a recorded course that way. But there's no substitute for an actual course with an actual instructor. If you have the opportunity to do that at Duke, I would do that, um, especially for the sort of key languages right now are Java. And then if you are in computer science, Python is becoming a lot more popular in computer science fields, not as much in product level fields, unless you're in a very small open source company, a lot of apps are made in Python. Um, so Python and Java, very, very popular. And again, you could Google anything you want about either of those languages, uh, but that's not the way to learn them. <laughs> so, uh, so if you have a, a course at Duke, I would enroll in it just for the fun of it, if not actually trying to get into it from a, a real design and, and efficiency perspective. Terrific. And also paste in the chat, in addition to academic courses, um, graduate students and postdocs can take advantage of workshops and multi-part um, courses through collab routes and Duke data and visualization services at Duke Library. So those could also be some resources for you to apply instructor models rather than a Our time has flown uh, by to uh, all of us together this morning. I want to thank Dr. Janessa for being so generous with his time and expertise with all of us. Um, Mike, would it be okay for folks to reach out to connect with you on LinkedIn? Um, I'm not on LinkedIn that I recall. I might have a profile from yesteryear. Um, I wouldn't even remember the password. 
feel free to reach out to me uh, at this email if you want to follow up. Um, but I'm I'm very bad at social media networking. Um, so yeah, email is email is fine. But please reach out because I know, especially at Xinglong over the math department, um, it's if you want to if you want to go outside academia. Uh, I know that professors are not always the greatest at knowing how you how you do that. Um, they're interested in in postdocing you. Nothing wrong with postdocs, but it wasn't for me. Terrific. Well, it's wonderful to see an example of a success story of somebody who carved out his own path in industry. And please, everyone in the audience, join me in a round of applause to thank Dr. Janessa um, for his time this morning and advice. Thanks so much, everyone.